able at this point to explain why. I'm recognizing what the drug has truly done to me. My emotionality is not derived from other humans, but rather from Gilligan. That's both deep and heavy. I've been programmed by somebody else's dreams. That's who I am. It's a very scary, scary thing. Ventura, California, some anonymous apartment complex. Father wasn't around much, mother worked all day. Three brothers, two bunk beds. Oldest brother is nine years older than me, so I have teenage brothers in high school going through their own puberty issues. Next room is three sisters having at it. There's no privacy in that kind of environment anywhere. One day, I discovered the hall closet. I'd go and sit in this hall closet, hours on end. Freedom. My mom was a social worker dealing with the worst juvenile delinquents that California had to offer. So by the time you know she got home from work, not much left over. My only friend was the two. The big joke in the family was they stuck me on top of a TV and told me that that's how I could be on TV. They sat me on top of it. I was raised by the television. I'm a television child. John F. Kennedy, the only thing that I really remember about his death is the fact he took up all the TV channels with bad programming. I could turn around the dial and it was always the stupid procession going through Washington and I couldn't get my cartoons. That sucked. Four o'clock in the afternoon, I drop everything to watch Gilligan. One of my most traumatic television moments happened on an episode of Gilligan's Island. There is a scene where Gilligan is watering the vegetables. The skipper puts the spigot into the front of Gilligan's shirt Lo and behold, what happens is the water fills up in his belly. The skipper has impregnated Gilligan. And that was very disturbing. It wasn't John F. Kennedy or Marilyn Monroe that had the most influence on, on American culture and society, but rather it was Sherwood Schwartz, the creator of Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch. Who I am is much more like Sherwood Schwartz than it is like my parents. That's how it works. For the last eight years, 
I've been guiding the, the, the art scene in New York City, clearly. There's, I mean, clear in my mind, there's, not even, there's no one close to me. 1997, I bought a loft that was just an empty hole. Phase two was the actual installation of the gear. I built a light industrial television studio, half a million dollars, complete with a control room, grid system, industrial conduit, wiring, everything. They put in 32 cameras, 70 microphones, refrigerator camera, cat box camera, cameras hanging down on poles that are on pan and tilts, two cameras behind the bathroom mirrors, which are hidden, but only for aesthetic reasons camera in the toilet going upward, and a bedroom camera. A Kodak moment on steroids. Putting the cameras in is one thing. Then the next thing you have to do is make sure that the cameras follow you. I can't have an engineer in the control room 24-7. There's sensors attached to the cameras so that when you walk around my house, so it's all automated. You open the refrigerator, it stares right at you. They all follow me everywhere, and they watch the cats in the cat box. As soon as the sensor picks them up, a camera works. So they're on edge. The animals are on edge. I met Tanya four years ago at an art party. She got into We Live in Public. She spent time making sure the camera angles were right and that she emailed back to the audience and that she talked to them every night on a regular basis at the regular time. The camera likes her. She understands the intricacies of the net and, you know, she's beautiful. I mean. If it worked out, we'd conceive a child and I'd ask her to marry me. For whatever reason, she just turned out to be the right person. And I think all along she knew the same thing. I knew she would do a certain thing for me in the performance of We Live in Public. She was actually quite exquisite at the work. I, mean, I cast well and I directed well. I directed the reality quite well. How many people were watching you? Three to 400 people simultaneously. And then in a given day, that adds up to maybe 10,000 people. I'm a celebrity in a way. I'm not even in a way, I'm a celebrity. I live in public, I'm a celebrity. There are people who watch me. I've been iterating and iterating and iterating to find the formula. The basic tenet is, is you have a video screen on one side and a chat screen on the other. And so they can compare notes as they watch the interactions of my life. So I've got this Greek chorus watching me, me, me. If you're a middle-aged man sitting in front of a monitor of some sort, 
and watching and consuming, consuming the electronic calories over your being, would you rather integrate into my story and see yourself in me, or would you rather watch Survivor or whatever the usual fare on TV is? I trust the mirror. And the more that they can see a reflection that relates to them, the more they suck into it. Day we opened, the biggest single group of people signing on were from Singapore and China. Chinese military, Singapore government, Singapore Technical Institute, etc., etc. The mind blower, of course, of all of this is that they are treating this very seriously. The first month was like early internet days. It was exciting, young and alive, and we'd go out and how many chatters are in tonight? And then chatting for hours on end. It's this whole world, and they're in your world. Who did what, and then the phone calls that came in and while you were gone, and then you get the hacker guys come in, and this guy below would come in, and he'd start telling me how Tanya was talking to some guy or maybe cheating on me. Just enough information to make me wonder. You can't find your keys? No problem. You just yell out. Um, can somebody tell me where I left my keys? You wait 15 seconds and you go and you look and they tell you where your keys are. In a physical, real way, they're just an extension of my brain. Because I don't really ever see them. They may not be real. They may be a computer for all I know. I don't mind people watching me doing a number two in my bathroom, so long as they're not in my loft. If somebody was in the next room watching on the projection screen, it would be very, very uncomfortable. But as long as they're not in the facility, it's okay. The sex turned into sex and not romantic lovemaking. But I have to say that there's something about living in public that accentuates plain old sex. My bathroom, with the camera covered, we figured we were safe. And that was part of their turn on is because you know you're kind of hiding from the people. You're, they're there, but they know you're in the bathroom. They know something's up. There's some great turn on that. And we went kind of further than we normally would, had gone. Now the way that the automated cameras work, it takes the last signal and keeps the sound on. They were all listening. Every whisper, every little whisper in the ear, whatever. And we're talkers, suck, we talk and suck. I would call myself a very gifted amateur businessman. Very gifted, as good as you can get. I worked a lot of little jobs all my life. I worked as a dishwasher on my way to New York, and then I came to New York with 900 bucks. My first fortune was made from Jupiter Communications. I specialized in the internet, and as the internet started hitting, I was a regular in, on CNN, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, USA Today, the Los Angeles Times, International Press, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, I knew exactly what I was doing. When it went public, I sat there and I watched it go from 21 to 40. You could just watch your wealth grow. Literally, I watched myself be worth, at a moment in time, $36 million. You don't believe it. It's irrational to you. In the subsequent two years, when I've now down to three or four million dollars, if it ever happens again, I've already gone through my nouveau riche stage. You know, it's been quite a uh, learning experience.
How much money did you lose while you were living in public? Well, 12, 14 million dollars. My grandmother on my mom's side had a stroke. All my brothers and sisters went and visited her in the hospital, stroked out. She was conscious but couldn't do anything. I love my grandmother, and I just didn't want to see her like that. So I worked out a gig where I was on a network news show. I did the piece. I found out when it was on, called the nursing home, told them to make sure that my grandmother watched with all the other, you know, invalids. Show went on. Next day, she died. I called her up and said, hey, I'm on network television. She was with all these other people, and I did the coolest visit. Putting yourself on TV as a gift of love. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. There are two types of people who live in public. There's the Tanya category who tends to integrate with the audience or the watchers. They like to be called observers. And then there's the Josh people who just want to be observed. I just want to know they're there. I don't really want to talk to them much. Once in a while, I'll say hi, and I'll see that they're there, and just connect a little bit. I had one major fight with Tanya. It was the one where I accused her of being boring in bed. We took the gloves off, and it was sort of like, screw the watchers. Anything we could think of to hurt the other person, we did. The moment the fight ends, the first thing we did is rush to our respective corners, which were our terminals, to see everyone's viewpoint on how the fight went. And that was more interesting than the fight. So what kind of feedback did you get they talked to her about that, not me. She changed. She changed, not me. Her approach to sex changed. And, you know, lo and behold, the sex wasn't boring anymore. Just FYI. They understand my life better than I do. They are objective about the things that I'm doing. And sometimes they want to have input. They're jonesing to make me do things. They would bring up all the times that I didn't wash my hands after using the bathroom, which is a very odd experience. It's a definite reminder that they're watching you do your very intimate functions. And as much as I try to hide everything, they still can tell. Big Brother isn't a person, as it turns out. It's the collective consciousness that watches. After a while, you just go and wash your hands. It's not worth the trouble. People will literally be purchasing slices of my life. There'll be tapes of my life stacked up. If you're a collector, you'll collect tape 233, me sleeping or me screwing or Tanya changing her clothes. You'll collect a piece of life. So part of my product line has to incorporate me with a filled up soul and me with an empty soul and everything else between the, the girlfriend, the maid, the cats, the good friends, the betrayals, the bill collectors on the phone, the stockbroker on the phone. I have to have a complete product line. You're beating your husband, and you don't know why you're doing it. You go back to the shelf two generations back, 2010, you're in, say, 2070, your grandmother and how she treated your grandfather on your mother's side, not your father's side, because you know it didn't happen there, you've already been there, and you find that your mother's beaten your father. 
And then you go to the next generation down and you can find, oh, well, you know what? I see how it went from generation to generation. And my father was actually looking at himself, look at his father, and he made a little bit of an adjustment, but now I can sort of see two generations and make the complete adjustment or not. But isn't life made possible by not knowing everything? I don't know where you got that from. It's not that living in public is going to be imposed on us. We're going to be conditioned to ask for it. Fourth quarter 2004, I'll roll out the consumerized version of We Live in Public. And I'll charge them for the platform, and I'll charge them for recording their lives to disc. Now you can have it too. bought these apple orchards. The trees on the apple orchard, they're pretty well cared for. In one sense, they're better off than the wild apple trees. But they burn out faster, and you put new trees in to replace them faster. What I'm starting to see is that there's a direct parallel between running an apple orchard and living in public. They're taking little pieces of you continuously. The collection of them is greater than little me. I'm just a product. I'm a product to be harvested. Harvesting you? Yeah. They're harvesting my psyche in order to feed themselves. If you were God, you already did Jesus. That trick's been done. How do you promote Messiah version 2.0? What's the marketing and ad campaign? There's so much noise in the world. There's so many TV programs. How does God cut through the clutter? It's the virtual God that's coming. It's not some guy showing up as a man. I mean, that's as plain as day. Gilligan's like the harbinger of all of that. Gilligan is the beating heart. The beating heart of it all. If you had to find the pinpoint, that would be it. I go home and I watch TV every night for six hours, at least, and the cameras are on me. You're there watching television while there are people in turn watching you on television. Yeah. Half living with a girlfriend and half living with the television set. Equally horrific. We were going along fine, except something happened. I was almost goaded into it. As we were breaking up, they told Tanya to have me sleep on the couch. I couldn't figure out where it was coming from, and then I subsequently found out that they'd been encouraging her to do that. Now, I give Tanya a birthday present, a Roloflex camera. Beautiful camera. $600 all in, tax and film and whatever. It was like I'd given her a piece of defecation. And that was the turning point for me when I had to remove her from the house. I bought her clothes and jewelry and the whole nine yards, and then I'd get presented with a bill. She charged me half for the food that she bought. I give her the Roloflex camera and I get like a $10 toy gun, and she's giving me grief. The watchers couldn't believe it. It validated I wasn't out of my mind. But you know, it's like, <laughs> I paid her the money. You know, and she went away.
It just accelerated what I probably in my heart of hearts already knew. If I hadn't lived in public, I might have asked her to marry her day 50, and we might have conceived a child and got married on day 100. I probably saved myself a fortune on a divorce. And I saved some unborn child a lot of grief and maybe Tanya some heartache. A lot of divorced people out there that are thinking, you know, I should have lived in public. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that grieved her the most about her leaving was not so much that she was leaving our relationship. She was grieving because she had to leave public. Who got the watchers? You know, who got the kids? Who got the watchers? Those watchers, that's how she defines family. Those are the closest people to her in the world. I had to get her out. I had to finish the work. I needed to have a plot point change, and it worked. When I was with Tanya and in a relationship, I was curious to see what they had to say. When I'm alone, I don't really want to touch them. It's a different experience. I'm afraid to face them. Big Brother is scaring the heck out of me. It's like I'm protecting the last layers of my soul. It's okay to, to scoop out fat, but when they start carving out muscle, you got problems. I'm down to the bone, beyond the muscle, like a skeleton scurrying across, yeah. What would be an example of, say, bone or muscle? Um, masturbating at this point. It used to be going to the bathroom. It used to be guarding what I say so it couldn't be used against me. You can't masturbate openly. I mean, you can't. Sex went away when Tanya went away, and even that was a problem. But when you can't even do it with yourself openly and freely, you can't even have fantasies. They're in your fantasies, like, can they hear me breathing? That's bone. I just don't want to give them anything more. They'll kill me. They'll take something from me that I can't replace. You're still in that loft? It's still in the loft, it's still on. I leave it on. I understand what you gotta do to make a masterpiece. I'm not there yet, but I'm building up to it. There's probably five or 10 more years to go. Then I'm maybe free. I'll go live on the orchard and have a family. You know, I might be a late bloomer on that respect. I make it that far. <laughs>